those of you who know me primarily in an orthodox context, naturally, um, you may not know that I was already a writer and public speaker and, and public figure um, before we became orthodox in 1993. I was, um, let's see, my husband and I went to Episcopal Seminary in Virginia. He was an Episcopal priest. I was a mom at home. I taught natural childbirth classes. And I was, I had been converted from pro-choice to pro-life by an article I read in Esquire magazine, of all places, that it just described an abortion. And I was so, I was such a consistent non-violence person, anti-war, anti-death penalty. I was vegetarian for a while. And I thought, how have we taken what is obviously an act of violence right into the heart of feminism? Um, but I was kind of snobbish, and I didn't really care for pro-life people. I thought they, you know, just didn't really like that style. Then I heard of an organization called Feminists for Life. It was a very tiny organization, but it was, it was a secular group that put forward the secular feminist arguments that abortion is actually... Um, that it's a form of violence and that it is a, a bad thing for women, that it harms women. Uh, we could quote Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and um, that was a good fit for me. So I began doing some public speaking, writing, and so forth as a representative of Feminists for Life. One day I got a phone call from a reporter at the Religion News Service, and she said, there are a couple of women that are mediation lawyers and they want to start a discussion group where they will bring together pro-life and pro-choice people and help them dialogue. They could facilitate discussion so that they could talk and understand each other. And so she just wanted a reaction. I said, that sounds great. I, am, I think that's terrific. I'd really be in favor of that and hope to learn more about it. So the next day, the um, story came out, and it said, Frederica Matthews Green, comma, a leader in the common ground movement. <laughs> and a few hours later, I got a call from one of the women saying, we understand you're a leader in the common ground movement. <laughs> That's how these things happen. Um, so uh, I said, I, I, I love this, and I want to help out any way I can. So we, um, we started with some small groups. We started meeting regularly in small groups in Washington. And gradually it spread. Um, it was never a really big movement. It's self-selected, of course. It's pro-lifers who would like to talk to pro-choice people and pro-choice people who'd like to talk to pro-lifers. Um, so it never was going to be very big. But we managed to have 12 different cities across the US where groups were meeting regularly for discussion and had two national conventions. And um, at one of them, it was me and Naomi Wolf, you know, were paired up, the two of us talking about our own views, but also what we understood of the other side. This is not, um, it was, we called it common ground, and that was often misunderstood to mean compromise. It is not compromise. What we meant common ground in the sense of a safe space. Of a, of a ground where we could come together and be able to say what we believed without being attacked or, or intentionally misunderstood. It was just a safe place to talk where we might discover some possible areas of overlap. Um, so it was, the, the idea was not to forge a compromise position, but just a place where we'd be free to, free to talk freely. Um, and uh, I used to say the goal of common ground is so that we can understand each other. We want, to we want to overcome misunderstanding so we can arrive at genuine disagreement. <laughs> we knew we were going to disagree at the end of the day, but we didn't have to misunderstand what the other person thought or believed. Uh, this kind of communication doesn't just happen. It takes skilled facilitation. Our, um, our way to get started is we would divide people into groups of four. We have two pro-life, two pro-choice, and sit in chairs, you know, just four chairs, looking at each other. And one person would explain why they held the position they did. Um, we, we asked them to think in terms of, if possible, to phrase it as, what experience did you have that brought you to your convictions on this issue? And I would talk about being very strongly pro-choice, taking a friend of mine before Roe v. Wade up to New York so she could have an abortion. 
and then reading this article and how it disturbed me so deeply. Um, and then if I told my story, a pro-choice person listening, her job would be to tell, again, to summarize what I had said in terms that I thought were accurate. She would be able to tell back to me, you are pro-life because X, Y, Z. And then the tables would be turned, and a pro-choice person would tell his convictions and why he arrived at that, and a pro-lifer would respectfully and accurately, uh, satisfying his sense of accuracy, explain why he held the position he did. It was, um, it was very liberating to at last feel like a pro-choice person really understands what I'm trying to say because we get so used on both sides to having our viewpoint distorted or turned into a parody of what it really was. It was, um, it was very gratifying, very touching to, have, to listen to pro-choice people who were able to reproduce what I was saying in respectful terms. And likewise, when I listened to a pro-choice person and summarized what he had to say about why he believed what he did, it helped me to understand. I, I did want to understand what the motivations of my opponents were. It does no good even, you can think, just in terms of strategy. I was never in politics. I never wanted to be involved in politics. Um, but even among politicians, they, they don't want to aim at the wrong target. They need to be able to answer the sincere objections or questions of people on the other side. So to begin with that, you have to be able to understand it. We had some useful ground rules. One was you're not allowed to try to persuade anybody. You can speak about what you believe, but you're not supposed to try to pull people around and change their mind. Another was that you call people by the, the name, the label, that they themselves choose. So, so pro-lifers would not call pro-choice people baby killers. They would say pro-choice. That's the term they choose. Pro-choicers would not call us um, anti-choice. They would say pro-life. That was the name we choose. It's just, a, it's just a simple mark of civility to do that, to offer that amount of respect to the other side. And another, um, another, what I think was perhaps the most useful thing that I took away from it was that we were admonished to ask sincere questions. You were not allowed to ask rhetorical questions where you were trying to trip somebody up, where you already knew what the answer was you were trying to force them to say. No rhetorical questions, only sincere questions. And that was defined as a question you don't know the answer to something you're gen genuinely curious about and you don't know the answer and you'd like to find out what it is, how they answer this question. I found it to be a, um, a really useful group for me. It was very useful to me spiritually to understand the struggles of people on the other side, even the people on our own side. Um, I found, um, for example, that people who were pro-life kind of political leaders um, had less of a concept of how much women wrestle with in an unplanned pregnancy than pro-lifers who work at pregnancy care centers, obviously, because they're helping women all the time, and they understand the range of problems that face a woman if she wants to continue an unintended pregnancy. And likewise, I found that pro-choice women, who are mostly political-type leaders, strategists, theorists, they were less aware that it was actually people who worked in abortion clinics who had the most sensitivity to what a struggle this is for a woman, how ambivalent she might be, what kind of pressure she might be under from the father of the child. Um, if anything, they were more ambivalent than the, the political strategists were about whether abortion is actually helping women or not. Um, there are always such complex situations that people see both in pregnancy centers and inside abortion clinics actually dealing with these problems that women have in this situation. So um, there was plenty of good advice there for people that um, disagree, uh, some tools you can use for how to listen to people um, who disagree with you. Uh, to listen to them, not to label them with names or labels they wouldn't choose, to ask questions that you sincerely wonder what the answer is. Don't try to trip them up, and don't spend all your time trying to persuade them. Try to grasp what they're trying to say. 
one thing about this, though, is we were proceeding on the assumption that um, kind of the whole framework is you have pro-life and pro-choice, and they're equally in balance. But that isn't really the case, because um, we, we didn't come to the table with equal amounts of power or social standing or resources. There was one side that had all the power, so to speak. The pro-choice had the status quo. That wasn't going to change. They had the support of the media in general. They had even, even among Republicans, even under Republican presidents, they had most of the political power. It was the fashionable position. It was what the in crowd thinks, is the support of the, of the pro-choice position. And um, I think we're naive if we don't make account, make allowances for that or uh, keep that in the account when we think about dialoguing with those who disagree, um, that uh, it matters if you're, if you're in the in crowd. It does give you more power for your position or your opinion. And uh, I think there's a, an easy test if you're not sure where does the power lie in any particular controversy. Uh, I call it the New York Times test. Uh, what position would the New York Times endorse? Well, if you can identify that, then you really know where the power lies. Where, what is the elite? What is the, the, um, the certainly in our culture, the, the media, entertainment, um, the ac academia, all of that will support one side more strongly than the other. That explains something that I had noticed, that if I was in a debate, if I was saying why I believe that abortion was damaging to women, that it didn't solve their problems, that it just changed a woman's body to fit her into a society that finds it inconvenient for her to be pregnant, that um, it may solve all the problems of everybody else in her life, but it's a brutal solution for her. I would say things like that, and then in a debate, my opponent would get up, and she would totally ignore everything I said, and basically she would say, she's a bad person. It was totally an ad hominem argument. It would ignore everything. She wouldn't even talk about abortion at all. It was just those anti-choice anti people are bad people. And um, the thing that was so discouraging was that was exactly what the audience was longing to hear. They wanted a reason to discount me, to not listen to what I was saying. I think because it was the unpopular opinion, that there's no reward to becoming pro-life. If you're in the middle, you become pro-life, you gain nothing, and you've taken on the unfashionable opinion. So um, the audience was really looking for an escape route so they wouldn't have to listen to what I was saying anymore. Um, and. Uh, that was discouraging for me to realize that there wasn't really going to be such a thing as a debate where ex ideas are actually exchanged, that it was just, you know, put the person down, uh, blackball them, give the audience a reason not to listen to what they're saying. We had to endure a good deal of um, contempt from others. I remember a, a TV host saying to me when we were off the air, um, other anti-choicers, at least they admit that they only care about fetuses. But you feminists for life, you're worse than they are because you pretend, you lie, and you pretend that you care about women. Um, when people have that kind of conviction that that's your motivation, it's, it's very hard to get through. I found that I, I learned how to listen to those that disagreed with me, but I very rarely found anyone who disagreed with me who was willing to listen to me. And sometimes you just have to accept that. That's, that's just the way it is. You go on bearing witness, you do it in the gentlest and most winsome ways that you can. You don't always get anywhere, though. Most, will, most people are unwilling to go through that, of being uh, faced with contempt, being treated that way. And um, after a while, I thought, well, maybe we've We've gotten everybody in America that's willing to be identified with this unpopular cause. Um, I no longer saw that there was real hope of, of, of winning anything. And in time, the whole issue kind of went away. Obviously, it's never going to be resolved, but um, it's not in the headlines like it used to be. It kind of submerged. People just got tired of hearing about it, I think. The um, Common Ground organization, after the, like the late 90s, they were no longer able to get funding because the focus had just shifted from the abortion issue, and so it kind of closed down. That was 
It was a wonderful experience while it lasted, though, and I think I learned a lot about techniques for listening. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves, what are you trying to achieve in a situation where you're in conversation with someone you disagree with on a, to a very serious degree? Um, what are you trying to achieve there? Do you want to just state what you believe? Do you want to just stand up and proclaim, this is what I believe the truth is, I'm just going to say it? Or do you want to bring people over to your side? Do you want to talk so persuasively that they will consider what you're saying? They will begin to weigh it. They will begin to think things through, maybe give them some new ideas. I find that really those are two different kinds of people. There are proclaimers and they are persuaders. Proclaimers and persuaders. It's good for you to know about yourself which one you are so that you, you can know where you're going. Um, I, I noticed not long ago, um, we, we put up, we hold up, literally, we hold up as an example in the Orthodox Church, St. John the Baptist. We hold him up on our iconostases, and he stands there with his head in a bowl by his feet and a scroll saying, look what happens to those who rebuke the ungodly. Um, and uh, we really don't do it. There's not much climate today where you can rebuke anybody for their sexual behavior. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of backlash if you want to correct something in society that you think is wrong. How do you possibly persuade? St. John the Baptist did not persuade. If you look to the end of the story, he was willing to proclaim even at the cost of his life. But Herod Antipas remained married to Herodias for the rest of his life. He didn't find St. John's words persuasive. It didn't change anything. To me, it's very important to persuade, to keep giving people provocative ideas that they can think about. It's not just about gratifying our desire to shout out what we think. You know, there, there's more to it than that. We want to find ways that we can win people. At the bigger situation, of course, is to win people to Christ. That's much more important than, than these various debates and arguments. If, if you win their hearts to Christ, then that begins a process of transformation. So that's what we're aiming at. Um, yesterday, we heard several people talk about St. Seraphim's advice. If you acquire the Holy Spirit, you'll save a thousand around you. Um, we heard, and I often hear people talk with um, almost bewilderment about how can you talk about Christ? How can you present the Christian faith in a way that's persuasive, that people will listen to? There's so much contempt for Christianity. I remember in my college days that I was very happy with every kind of esoteric religion you could think of. I was hopscotching around, but I had no respect for Christianity. I don't know why, but it bugged me. And when I met Christians, I wanted to make them miserable. I wanted to mock them and insult their God. I blasphemed. I did everything I could to undermine their faith. Where does this hostility come from? Aimed at Christianity and not at other faiths. Um, and I, with my other you know, hippie buddies, I would say there's something about those Christians, those Jesus freaks, those born agains. They just irritate me so much. You know what it is? It's they're too clean. They're too clean. They have that squeaky, shiny, clean quality. I think what was bothering me was purity. I think it was the beauty of purity. I think it was awed by the beauty of your virginity. Gabriel stood amazed. I think that purity, sexual purity, is a powerful thing. And we've forgotten that. I think all the emphasis on traditional marriage when, forgive me, but heterosexuals have already destroyed traditional marriage. Um, I believe we should be focusing on that, that challenging beauty of purity, because that's, that's what our beloved Theotokos shows us. And that is definitely the spiritual element that I felt when I came in contact with Christians that most irritated me. I think there's a power there. Well, um, I'm going to wrap up. Um, yesterday, we were talking several times about, as I said, Saint Seraphim, acquire the Holy Spirit, you'll save a thousand around you. How hard it is to speak of our faith. It is, as soon as you say Jesus, people stop listening. 
It's like America was given an inoculation with Christianity. They got just enough of it to make them immune, so they can't take it seriously. Um, so it seems like the only thing we can do is live the life, try to be transformed, try to be the kind of person that others, that others sense and they're drawn to and attracted to. Some decades ago at a conference, I heard that approach called evangelism by narcissism, that I am just going to be so lovely and so peaceful and so profound that everybody will be drawn to me and they'll say, oh, what is your secret? How do you get to be like this? And you know, if you think about it, think about you, if you met a wonderful, lovely, peaceful Buddhist, would you leave Christ? You know, you're not gonna leave your deep beliefs just because of this one person who's so exemplary. Um, I, I just had some doubts about how how effective that is. Definitely we have to do it. We have to live transformed lives. But um, I don't know if that's the thing that we can really expect will cause people to change. For one thing, the ways that Christ changes us, that, that we grow in humility, that we grow in kindness and gentleness, these are not things that the world respects. You know, they, they expect the powerful guy that punches out his opponent. They expect, they respect power, they respect sexual attraction, they respect so many things that aren't necessarily the ways Christ is going to change us. I think we, we need to always remember that every conversion is an inside job, that people are transformed on the inside, not head first by having thoughts, you know, by, by injecting new thoughts into their heads, that um, the Holy Spirit is already working inside everybody. He's everywhere present. He's filling all things. There's, you can't keep him out. And so I think we need to be in prayer for those that we would like to see come to Christ, whether they're people we know personally or somebody in the media. Um, always be praying for those, that the Holy Spirit will begin to move inside of them and you know, um, the Lord is totally capable of putting somebody next to them on a subway train that starts saying, well, you know there's that line in scripture. The Holy Spirit's totally capable of putting them in positions where they overhear something, where they see something or they read something that gives them those new ideas. The Lord has it all under control. So we need to be transformed. I don't think we can expect that transformation is of itself going to convince anybody. Um, but just remain in profound prayer and try to support the work the Holy Spirit is already doing. Um, I, we heard yesterday several exhortations to say the Jesus prayer or recite the Jesus prayer. I would say don't do that. Don't say the Jesus prayer. Don't recite the Jesus prayer. Pray the Jesus prayer. It's not a magic formula that works if you just keep repeating it. You need to address it to the Lord Jesus Christ who is present with you every minute. Be speaking to him. It's a, it's a, it's a dialogue in a sense. You, um, you're addressing it to him in awe, in respect, in humility. Um, don't use that just like a magic coin. Keep, when you say it, Repeat it over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times a day. But don't just recite it. Pray it. Pray it to the Lord. That's where the transformation happens. And the other thing, I think the, the best thing we can do in order to reach non-believers is to have your story ready. <clears throat> I think that all of us have at least one story about something that happened in your life that made you realize there really is a God and he really knows you and he knows you by name that he, he knows that you're there and he attends to your needs. Each of us has at least one story. If there's one thing that we see immense hunger for, it's the supernatural. That's why people are fascinated by ghosts and reincarnation and things like that. They want some evidence. They're not willing to take the Bible or Christianity at face value, but they do want to see some evidence that there's some supernatural reality out there. Um, I, one of my books I hope to, to write eventually would be a summary of all the different times I've seen God work miraculously in my life, um, beginning with my conversion story itself, which I've told so many times. Um, I had totally rejected Christianity. I had hopscotched, as I said, through many different Eastern religions in college, 
And um, eventually, the, the wisest thing anybody said to me in those days was, if you go on patching together a religion out of little bits and pieces, you will never grow because your choices are based on your limited understanding. You will only choose the things you like. And that's not going to change you. That will just reinforce the way you already are. You should choose one of the great traditions and submit to it. And at that point, I chose Hinduism. And at my wedding, May 1974, I read a Hindu prayer out in the woods, flowers in my hair, the hip, classic hippie, hippy-diffy wedding. Um, and it was just a month later, hitchhiking around Europe with, with my husband. I walked in a church in Dublin, and um, walking around, I saw a statue of Jesus. And as I was standing there looking at it, I realized that I had fallen to my knees and I could hear a voice speaking to me. It wasn't, a, um, it wasn't anything I heard with my ears. It was like an inner voice. And it said, I am your life. You think your life is your name, your personality, your history. That is not your life. I am your life. You think your life is the fact that you breathe and that you, you have biological liveliness. But that is not even your life. I am your life. I am the foundation of everything else in your life. Um, it, was, it was frightening. I, I stood up again. I felt very shaky. I didn't know what to make of it. Um, it took me a while for my theology to get in line with that. I was still, well now, instead of a Hindu, I'll be a Christian, but it's all the same. It's still all one world religion. It took me a while in some teaching to, to realize the fullness of the faith. It was like there was a little radio in my heart that I had never known was there, and suddenly it snapped on, and um, this voice just filled my awareness. It was like, um, it must be what taking crack must be like, because I was so addicted to Jesus Christ from that moment onward. I wanted nothing but to read the Gospels, to pray, to talk to him, to think about him, to talk about him. Um, it, God can do that to me. He can do it to anybody. So if there's somebody that's on your heart that you pray for, that he'll come to Christ, just know that God can leap over any wall that we put up. Um, he can turn anybody around and fill them with that desire to draw closer to him. Um, so anyway, I hope to write a book that will start with that story and tell all the many miracles and interventions I've seen in my life. But the world doesn't need one book with 50 stories in it. The, the world needs 700,000 church-going Orthodox Christians in America, and they all have stories. You will all find opportunities to tell your stories. So prepare your story. Live the life. Pray. Prepare your story. I think that those are the ways that we should go about trying to win the world back to Jesus Christ. All right. Um, finally, here's my friend Rod. And uh, I'm going to let him take over, or Rebecca. Come on over, Rod. I, uh, I have spent my life as a, my career in opinion journalism, which involves trying to uh, convince people to, to change their minds about things. And that has become more and more difficult as the culture has become more and more what uh, Alistair McIntyre calls emotivist. In other words, people, if they feel something is true, they think it's true. It's very hard to, to uh, use the traditional methods of, of argumentation to convince people if, um, if they don't feel in their hearts that something is true. Uh, normally, we would use reason, logic, um, you know, premise, 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 conclusion. Um, and I would get so frustrated when I would be, when I would write columns that would make, follow this ar form of argumentation, and it wouldn't move people. They, it's like they couldn't read what I was actually saying. But when I got on the editorial board of the Dallas Morning News, which is maybe 10 of us who would sit around and debate issues all the time to try to come up with a, a, an editorial line on any political or cultural issue we were writing about, I began to see why my standard column uh, uh, formula really wasn't working. Um, because, and this involved me having to 
listen more closely to my colleagues, not in the sort of narrow forensic sense of listening for weaknesses in their argument and pouncing to point them out and trying to you know, pin them to the ground, but actually to listen to them and, and to empathetically to try to understand why they believe the things that they believe so that I could put myself in their position and hopefully try to convince them uh, that they were wrong and I was right, but to do it from a, from a more empathetic, emotional point of view. Now, sometimes doing that, things got flipped, and I, uh, I had my own opinion changed. But that's okay, because we were trying to search for the truth, not just to defeat each other. Um, although sometimes, I, I think my boss, who was female, would have said that about the guys on the editorial board, that we just wanted to defeat each other, just to beat each other. And that was one instance in which I actually learned something about the difference between men and women in these kinds of, kinds of debates. Um, our boss, uh, again, who was a woman, she had a really good way of trying to bring us all together toward a sort of consensus, which is what we were, we were looking for. By, but she would have to sort of keep the male egos on the editorial board, me having one of the bigger ones, in check. Um, and uh, so having to learn, learn how to listen to people was really an important aspect of my job so I could do it well. Um, I, I think about the times some of my colleagues on the editorial board changed my mind about things. What did they actually do to, to make that happen? Well, in, in some cases, it was the standard thing. It was, um, you know, they showed flaws in my reasoning uh, of my position and caused me to change my mind. But as I was thinking about it, preparing for this, uh, this presentation, I realized that more often than not, I had to believe that my editorial, my colleagues were not simply trying to defeat me, but they were listening to me. They showed me that they had heard what I was saying and they simply disagreed. They, that's all they were doing was disagreeing. They weren't any sort of threat to me. Now, it, it seems I'm embarrassed to say that as a, as a grown man that I thought sitting around a table debating an issue that somebody, my, my colleagues, were a threat to me. But that's part of what it means to be in an emotivist culture. You know, I, I felt that uh, I, I, I had my back up and I felt like I had to defend my territory. Well, the colleagues who changed my mind, they, they would say in so many words, hey, I hear you, Rod, I hear what you're saying, but have you thought about it this way? And they would, they would come at me with, uh, often with stories, not just arguing principles, but arguing stories and examples that uh, would help me rethink my own principles in a different way. And what they would try to do is use these stories, these real life examples, to convince me that I was wrong. And uh, it, it's, it's amazing how once you make concrete, just the normal principles, moral principles, once you make them concrete, things change. You do become more empathetic because you realize that real life is not, uh, people aren't arguments, people are people. And um, that's how I ended up changing my mind, for example, on uh, civil unions. This is, gosh, a decade ago, more than a decade ago, when the, 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 inter the argument for same-sex couples was over civil unions as a substitute for full-blown same-sex marriage. I listened to some of my colleagues talk about gay friends of theirs and what they had to put up with and, you know, I said, imagine um, so-and-so in the hospital and his partner can't visit him, he's on his deathbed and he can't visit him because that sort of thing really challenged me and made me think about the, the implications of my positions against same-sex un civil unions. And um, that was really effective. Um, I. I think it is possible, though, to go too far in that way, in both uh, with yourself as someone who's being argued with and as someone trying to convince the other one. Uh, a character in War and Peace says, to understand all is to forgive all. Now, this is an ambiguous line. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's about mercy. It's about having, like, if you walk in somebody else's shoes, then you can easily forgive them for what they've done. Um, but the problem with that is, if you walk, if you put yourself too completely in somebody else's shoes, you can excuse them of things that they shouldn't be excused of. And you can be convinced by arguments they're making when you actually ought to be standing there and challenging them and saying, no. 
Uh, the, I hate to say it, but the best argument I can, or best example I can think of of this is my dear sweet mother. She is the kindest person to others. She loves animals. She feels sorry for anybody. But if uh, one of her grandchildren was arrested for human trafficking, uh, my mom would say, when CNN came to interview her, my mom would say, well, bless her heart, she was just trying to get those girls jobs. <laughs> Seriously, that's how my mom is, though. She's so empathetic. So I, I think that um, one thing we have to develop is a strategy to listen empathetically without surrendering our judgment. And uh, I'm sure every priest in this room, having been a pastor, has had to develop this, this sort of strategy. If you haven't, you will. Um, because people are really manipulative. We had a case in our parish recently with a, a recent convert who was extremely manipulative in this way. We didn't realize it till it was too late, and he's no longer part of the parish, but um, we, several of us in the parish who had tried to help him, sat around feeling very, very burned by the things he had said to us because we had put all our guards down. We knew that, we, we felt that he was manipulating us, but he had been really damaged over the course of his life by this or that, and we didn't see what was coming. And we realize now, we were talking about it with Father, um, how we should have been more, we should have challenged him more, but we were totally disarmed because we felt sorry for him. And, um, you know, we, we were all talking out, we're gonna end up having to have a session with those of us who tried to minister to this guy and help him out. We're gonna have to get together and have a session and analyze how things went wrong. But for us, I think the main error was an, over, uh, an, an overabundance of empathy. Uh, because of this guy's sob story and the hard life he's had. So I would just say that um, be careful when you talk to people not to go so far in identifying with them and empathizing and listening to them that you lose touch with what is true, what you know to be true. Um, and this is really, really difficult to do, especially for Southerners, I find, because we, we want there to be social harmony above all things. I can remember when my wife and I, she's from Texas, when we, uh, we married in the 90s and moved to New York City, we were invited to a, uh, a dinner party with uh, my boss, who was Jewish, and we were the only Gentiles there. And at some point, they started fighting over dinner. Julie and I just froze. We didn't know what to do. We wanted to escape. And finally, my host could see what was happening, and he said, you know we're not fighting. This is just how we talk in New York. And, <laughs> and um, so I, I, I think that this is a particular, and I'm not kidding, this really happened. I think this, this is a particular um, challenge for people who come from my culture, uh, or and not just from the South, but from cultures where we seek harmony and peace above all. Religious cultures can be that way. Um, that we try so hard to, to show the other that we can reach peace, we can reach agreement, and be diplomatic, that we surrender things that we really shouldn't surrender. So, um, I mean, I, I would have, in those days when I was getting used to living in New York, I would have said just about anything to calm people down in situations that were rancorous. But in fact, they were just having debate. This was just the local culture. Um, so it was, I had to really learn a new strategy for how to listen to people and realize that they're not really angry. They're just New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> and I think we can all find that wherever we live, that there, there, there are things like that. Um, Finally, I wanted to mention uh, the issue of how should we react as Christians when our interlocutor is disagreeable and even insulting. Um, this is where, believe it or not, praying the Jesus prayer has helped me a great deal. I, I have had a problem most of my life with anger. I'm quick to anger. And that really affects my judgment. It has affected my professional judgment. Um, I'll confess to you that you know, we were living in New York on 9-11. I was working for the New York Post. We were. Um, we were living, I was on the Brooklyn Bridge when the first tower came down. I was running towards the tower. I was so traumatized by that event, um, as everybody here was, but for me, I just could not get over my rage. And I was willing to believe anything my government told me to justify war. And uh, I look back on it with such shame. You know, I thought the people who were arguing against the Iraq war were either cowards or fools. And I said they, and I wasn't able to listen to them because I felt so threatened by what had happened on 9 11. 
And I was so angry about it that I wanted to get what I wanted, which was revenge, even as we now know on people who had nothing to do with it. I say that not to relitigate the war, but I've had to think in, 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 uh, in, in repentance of how my strong emotions about that war led me to believe things that just weren't true. Um, and uh, I wish that there had been, that someone had been able to get to me or I had had my defenses down enough to where I would have been able to listen to what they had to say. But I can remember that the people who were against the war and who were conservatives like me, I wouldn't listen to them. I just could not hear them. Uh, again, I thought they were cowards or fools. They would have had to have walked away from me back then because I was incapable of hearing them. And I, I think I've had to, um, I've had to develop that skill over the years of learning how to be calm when I'm faced with a situation that makes me really angry with a person who's making me really angry. Uh, over the years, practicing the Jesus prayer and learning how, uh, learning how my own sense of anger and, and being, uh, quickness to, to rage has affected me and affects my judgment. I've learned how to be calm and listen to people who say outrageous things, even insulting things, without, sh without reacting in the same way. But I've also had to learn how, you know, I'm not going to get anywhere with this person. This person is not listening to me. This is not a real dialogue anymore, and walk away from it. Again, the guy from our parish I just mentioned, um, we finally, in our group, had to decide that he can't hear us anymore and to continue talking to him. Uh, we, we kept trying to listen to him and respond to the things he was saying, but he kept moving the goalpost. And uh, it was a hard thing to do, especially for our pastor, who loves this man and you know is his spiritual father. But it was a hard thing to do to have to just cut, cut and run. But it's an, it's an essential thing to, uh, to, as you develop your tools, your toolkit for listening, to know when it's just not worth it anymore, and to be able to walk away without anger, without storming off, but just to say, brother, sister, this isn't going anywhere. I'm sorry, God be with you, but we need to stop this. Uh, it's a hard, there's no, there's no formula for doing that, um, but uh, I, I think what makes it even more difficult uh, these days is the thing I started out talking about, that we live in a culture where people find it very difficult to separate themselves and their sense of identity from different arguments. In other words, if you, if you reject somebody's opinion, then they say, oh, you hate me. Well, this is, this is the, the, uh, the principle or the stance taken by 13-year-olds, but now it has become a, a culture-wide thing. And uh, I honestly don't know how we're gonna deal with it. But I, one thing I do know is that as an Orthodox Christian, again, the Jesus prayer and learning how, not, how to keep inner stillness when I'm in a, a, a contentious situation and to try to realize, keep straight in front of me the idea that the person in front of me is a child of God and I need to try to listen to them and to hear them. Um, that has been invaluable at trying to negotiate the culture wars. So uh, those are my, my brief things, and I, I think I put them in questions that we can all talk about at our, at our tables. But um, these are issues that I think all of you will, will know in your own lives are very, very pertinent because we in our country seem to be becoming more and more angry and resentful and tribal, and we see the other not just as our opponent but as our enemy. And uh, this can't be the way of Christ. It just can't be. And I, I'm talking about myself, too. I'm implicated in this, too, because of the kind of work I do. So um, let us all try our very best to keep in mind uh, what C.S. Lewis said about every mortal we meet, that this is a, you're meeting, every person you meet is an immortal being. And uh, you have to remember that. They are souls. They are created by God. And uh, I can hear myself saying these words, and I'm immediately, my, my inner editorial writer is like, don't be sentimental, don't be sentimental. <laughs> but that's, that happens to be the truth. That's not sentimentality, that's reality. So thank you very much, and let's, uh, let's work on these, these things. And, and uh, I'll, well, Frederica, you and I will be coming around to the table to talk? Okay, thanks. Thank